Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight at the second talk of the spring edition of AFC Design Talks on Reimagining Cultural Heritage. In this edition, we are hosting three amazing female guest speakers who will present their work and discuss their ideas on cultural heritage, the role of design in supporting and reintroducing local uh, craftsmanship and ensuring its continuity. I'm uh, delighted to welcome tonight's speaker, Shraq Zureyqat, a Jordanian textile artist, weaver, and a wool researcher. Her research-based practice bridges various design disciplines through a fundamental appreciation and craft of fiber and textile media. Her work strives to unveil the sophistication of traditional handcraft, not through historicism, but as a part of an effective economy which continues to be driven by everyday necessity, human innovation, and our internal pursuit for beauty. In her talk tonight, From Traditional Craft to Mode of Design, Ishraq will address why designers need to expand their skills and knowledge to push the boundaries of design. She will share with us her personal journey as a curious designer who set out to produce her own raw materials in Jordan, where she discovered that it's possible and quite necessary for creatives to become craftspeople, depending, uh, deepening their uh, knowledge in material science, manufacturing, raw material production, and sourcing. And how this kind of knowledge and experience informed the design process from the start, helps creating unique products which can feed local economies and keep traditional craftsmanship alive. Thank you, Ishraq, for joining us tonight for uh, accepting our invitation and be there to share uh, with us your exceptional uh, journey and uh, beautiful work. So I will leave the word now to you. Uh, thank you so much, Ralia, and uh, thanks to AUC Design for hosting me. This is a very, very exciting uh, opportunity uh, for me, um, as I, I really uh, enjoy uh, seeing the um, uh, the design sort of philosophy at AUC um, and uh, the programs that are uh, educating and training our, you know, current and future designers and creatives. Um, yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I uh, can give just a very quick sort of background um, about myself. I have a bachelor degree in architecture from Virginia Tech and uh, I went on to do a master's degree in textiles and new materials design from Naba in Milano in Italy. Um, and uh, since then, I've really been just uh, working in uh, the realm of textiles, materials. Um, and lately, the last few years, I've been focused on researching, uh, creating new materials uh, based on wool uh, as a raw material. Uh, I would like to share with you all my journey, uh, how I uh, got introduced to this idea of craft, uh, practicing a new craft uh, that I was uh, learning, and how over time this practice of a craft and reflecting on its history and applying it to different materials uh, for different end uses has really put me on this path of material research and uh, material science, which uh, crosses into um, industry, uh, you know, uh, creation and uh, uh, craftsmanship. Um, so my journey started with uh, weaving. When I was uh, being educated, um, when I was being educated as a textile designer, um, one of the techniques I was introduced to is weaving. Uh, I found it to be very, very fascinating because being an architect by education and training, um, I saw it immediately as this technique that has so much potential as a construction technique. Um, weaving is this universal craft. It exists all over the world uh, throughout history. Different civilizations and different peoples have developed, uh, have come to basically discover weaving um, sort of intuitively and each locality, each uh, climate, each civilization has developed its own technology of weaving based on uh, the raw materials available to them uh, and have also pushed uh, this basic principle of weaving, 
which is again a user a universal principle um, of construction. Um, they've innovated the tools, the materials that they've been using in weaving uh, to what we see today. Uh, weaving and textiles uh, in particular are the building blocks of a lot of industries and weaving as a technique is really also part of that. It's, it's in the base of a lot of um, industries, a lot of uh, products that we use every day. Um, uh, you just don't realize that until you start actually learning about weaving. So uh, the universal principle of weaving is that you have two sets of threads or yarns going in perpendicular directions, uh, one set going in a ver vertical direction called the warp and another set of threads going in a horizontal direction called the weft. Now, how these two sets of threads interact together then creates all of these endless possibilities of all the different weave structures that we see today. And so as soon as I started learning this technique, uh, immediately, of course, being an architect, I started asking questions, you know, wondering, you know, how uh, are the different materials uh, created using weaving? Uh, one of the first uh, projects we were asked to work on uh, after we learned the basics of weaving, uh, the basic weave structures, is uh, something called, you know, a project called Touch. And the emphasis was on the tactile quality of this material that we will be weaving. And the guideline was that we couldn't go to the yarn shop and buy ready-made uh, threads or yarns that are traditionally used in weaving. So of course, being an architect, I went to the hardware store and started just looking around, uh, you know, seeing what I thought would be materials that worked with weaving. And so one of the first things that um, I wanted to do was play with silicone. I knew it was a material that um, is, you know, soft and once it dries, it becomes elastic. And so I started mimicking, you know, the traditional threads from just a straight thread to, uh, you know, mimicking the boucle effect, which is also, you know, sort of a, a type of thread. And then I started using that material that I created into the weaving mixed with other materials and started creating all of these different textures. So throughout this process, of course, I started uh, asking more and more questions, uh, realized that there's spaces not only between uh, the, the different threads of a weaving, but the thread itself can also create uh, spaces, um, three-dimensional spaces. So of course, again, always sort of in the base of my um, thought process as being an architect, I started to think about these spatial qualities of weaving. And of course, began to reflect because we in the Middle East do have a weaving tradition, but we've always seen it in a very uh, particular way. And by learning weaving on, uh, starting with a very basic frame loom, and then I moved on to uh, upright looms, they're called that really look like machines uh, that are assembled and stay in place and used uh, for all types of weaving. In my mind, I was always asking all of these questions as I was um, practicing more and more weaving. The first thing I became very curious about is how multiple uh, textiles are woven simultaneously in what is called a double weave or uh, the basis of jacquard weaving. So you have multiple textiles being woven at the same time and you have all these spaces in between the different layers. Of course, again, being an architect, I was very, very fascinated with this concept and immediately uh, wanted to try creating this kind of double weave using a very simple frame loom and discovered that I could actually adapt the pieces of this simple loom to enable me to create this thing which is considered an advanced kind of weaving. So I used a very simple tool. I borrowed an extra piece uh, identical to the piece that I had on my loom. Um, that allows me to separate the threads. I borrowed one from a friend of mine who has the same exact loom. I attached it to the bottom of the loom and I was able to create this uh, sort of uh, um, double weave by uh, weaving two textiles simultaneously. Of course, this always stayed with me as a first sort of experimentation into learning this basic craft and immediately starting to think about the more advanced versions of it. Uh, I moved on to, uh, again, wondering about Bedouin weaving, which is uh, what I uh, was familiar with in our part of the world. I started to uh, want to 
I learned about using ad what is considered advanced machines, upright looms that are very well designed, um, uh, made, uh, you know, very, very uh, beautifully to become even themselves as objects of beauty that enable you to weave so many intricate different types of textiles. Um, I always thought it was fascinating because I've always seen Bedouin weaving uh, done using uh, very uh, primitive tools. Nothing very, very fancy. You don't see a machine. Uh, it's done on the floor uh, using what's called a flat ground loom. Uh, so I uh, learned the Bedouin weaving from uh, Bedouin women in Jordan. And here you can see me sort of like, you know, uh, in the first moments of uh, discovering this craft. And I still remember that moment of going from something that is unknown to me, a mystery, to actually understanding it. And that feeling always stays with me and, and, and has been really instrumental for me uh, throughout my uh, practice as a designer. As you can see here, this form of weaving is actually a communal form. It's part of the culture, uh, just interwoven into the daily lives. It can be done outside. And that is really uh, the spirit of uh, our traditional Bedouin weaving. It's done with tools that are just found anywhere. The idea was that Bedouins always moved and they couldn't really um, create tools that were very, very big and difficult to move around. And so the idea came from uh, always having to pack their things and move. And so Bedouins actually developed this very simple, uh, almost primitive tool that enables them to weave some really intricate textiles um, uh, made out of the found objects, you know, uh, twigs, I mean, uh, pieces of wood, uh, pretty much anything. And my experience was when I went to learn weaving, um, the lady that taught me weaving just went behind her house and just started gathering, you know, uh, a metal rod from here, you know, a piece of this, uh, the stair um, railing that had broken off. And seeing that process also for me was just as important as learning the craft itself. We made the tool ourselves. And that was pretty much my introduction to weaving. That always stayed with me. And um, I started to want to practice the weaving myself to really get to a point where I can confront all the challenges, any problems that arise uh, and solve them myself and really look at myself as a craftsperson as opposed to a designer with a creative idea who asks people who are the craftspeople uh, to, do, to implement the design. And so I kept, I continued uh, practicing uh, the weaving, again, using found objects um, around the house. Um, and I started working on a piece that I exhibited at Amman Design Week in 2016, which came from this concept of a double weave using a very simple loom to create uh, what is more um, a complex kind of textile. And so I implemented this idea using the Bedouin weaving and the Bedouin loom. And I developed this concept into a, a full scale prayer rug because I thought that the notion of starting with one textile and then splitting into two fit very well uh, for a prayer rug. So uh, this is what it became. On the top, you can see the first sample that came out of that very small basic children's loom, uh, frame loom. And the bottom is the result of implementing that idea full scale on a Bedouin loom. Uh, I was able to use, uh, you know, the technique of weaving one textile and then being able to split it and weaving two uh, textiles simultaneously. And the entire rug starts to open up like a leaf. And so wherever the two leaves are on top of each other on one side becomes thicker and more comfortable uh, for the seating and for the kneeling down. So this was the concept of what I call the sajada, which I exhibited at the Amman Design Week in 2016. Uh, and I continued to um, explore and ask questions. I found myself when I was living in uh, the Hudson Valley of New York State, um, I discovered that I was living in an area that has a lot of what's called fiber agriculture. People who raise specific fiber animals to produce uh, specific types of uh, wools, alpacas, angoras, and so on. Uh, and that's when I became very fascinated with this idea of a localized economy, uh, people producing raw materials 
that were actually marketed to uh, the regional designers uh, and especially to designers in New York City. Uh, they were encouraged um, to source their fibers locally. And I uh, started to meet people who were involved in local movements uh, and things called like the Hudson Valley Textile Project and something called New York Textile Lab and uh, saw this sort of perfect working machine and it's a very sort of micro economy and it works very well. Um, of course, I started asking questions because I was seeing people like that producing their own raw materials, you know, all the way from taking care of the animal, knowing what to feed it, even crossbreeding to um, enhance the characteristics of the fiber uh, as a product. And uh, these people were able to process their materials such as this uh, artist, um, Paula Cusera is uh, somebody who used to be a muralist, a painter who left New York City and moved up to this region uh, and started growing uh, merino sheep and producing her own yarn and using her artistic um, uh, skills and, and practice to grow even a dye garden. So using plants that she grows locally on her property, uh, she's able to uh, dye all of these different wools uh, and produce yarns that can be sold. So as a product, it was this perfect, uh, truly local product. And I saw that it really worked. People were buying these uh, made in New York fibers and using them in their products, whether they're uh, selling designers or even uh, hobbyists. Of course, I'm always reflecting back. I'm thinking about Jordan, uh, the wool that we have that is abundant. I mean, this is a scene that is so common to us. Sheep are everywhere. Um, and I started to ask, what do we do with the wool that we have? And how does it compare to all these different animal fibers that I was seeing in uh, the Hudson Valley of New York, where I maintained um, a residence uh, for many years? Uh, here you see a lot of wool locally is being thrown out. And that's where I started to discover that it's a problem. We throw a lot of this resource out. Uh, there's no use for it locally and it's even become an environmental problem. So in my mind, I thought this just doesn't make any sense. Um, at the same time, I realized that to really learn about wool, I'm an end user as a designer of this material, but I can also learn more about it and start to understand this material from even a producer's perspective. And um, I discovered that I can become something called a wool grader and classer, somebody who learns everything about wool from genetics, um, breeds of sheep, to processing the wool, washing it and preparing it for the industry, to innovative uh, products like uh, making sneakers out of wool and active wear, uh, all the way to even the global wool market and how wool is sold and bought at auctions. That's when I realized that this is an entire global industry um, with a lot of uh, sort of standard practices that are set by this global industry to really maximize the quality and value of this, this uh, global resource. It's a natural resource. Uh, wool grows on the uh, animals, uh, sheep every year, and it has to be cut. So uh, we have this resource available to, to us, and we have to really think about how we can take advantage of it. And so part of this training was I learned everything from shearing, the proper cutting of the sheep off the animal, to how you clean it, how you select different kinds, uh, different parts of the fleece or wool for different end uses. And so you realize that nothing should be thrown out really. Uh, this is something that uh, doesn't only serve the textile or fashion industry as we commonly believe. Um, and so for me, this, this really uh, opened up doors uh, to really beginning to understand um, how I can apply this, uh, my uh, sort of curiosity, but also knowledge into this Jordanian resource that we have. So immediately I started to want to apply what I was learning uh, in, in this sort of uh, training that, is, uh, that was organized by something called the American Sheep Industry. Uh, so it's a very, very big industry. And uh, I realized that we don't have really a wool industry in Jordan. Uh, we don't really have global industry standard practices in Jordan. Uh, so I set off to just sort of discover what do we have in terms of practices with this uh, natural resource as a raw material? And where can I apply what I learned 
that was uh, part of this global standard practice into our uh, unique uh, environment and locality. And so immediately I wanted to dive deeper into this uh, material research. I began by collecting wool. This was in 2018. Um, I asked my parents to bring raw wool to these because I wanted to send it to a processing facility which was nearby uh, where I was living uh, because I realized that we don't have a processing facility in Jordan. And I was very curious to see this material that we've always processed uh, in a very primitive way by hand in Jordan. I wanted to see how it comes out if I send it to an advanced facility. I wanted to see what it would look like, what it would feel like as a product ultimately. And so that was for me the first step of what now I can look back and realize was this self-designed research approach to understanding better this raw material. Uh, so I received back these processed wool samples. You could see wool once it's washed and prepared for different end uses. It comes in a few different forms. Once you have these uh, different forms of wool, you realize when you look at it that although let's say you come from a certain industry, as I did, I came from, uh, you can see the fashion and the textile industry, immediately I started to look at it differently because I can see that it can be a raw material, not only for the textile industry or the fashion industry, it can be for so many other industries. When you see the raw material that you've always worked with in a way that was prepared for you by someone else, and then you see it in a, in a more raw form, you start to actually look at it differently. And that's for me what really uh, happened. So again, I looked back and I um, wanted to apply all of these uh, you know, practices and, and see, okay, we don't have an established industry, but how much can I do as an individual and apply as many of these practices onto the local um, uh, wool growing uh, you know, tradition and see what product I can come out with. Um, it helps to be very, very curious. I mean, I'm somebody who uh, had so many questions that I needed answered and I am very curious about this and I am willing to go out and stand you know, in the heat, uh, smell the, the animals, you know? Um, and so for me, it wasn't a problem. I was able to do all the steps. I didn't have to in a way um, commission someone else to do it. And for me, that was really seeing things for myself, being able to answer, uh, ask questions, and then you know uh, have sort of the answers for this long list of questions that I had for myself uh, was really, really uh, instrumental. And I will speak about this later and how this kind of experience will feed into your design process creatively, ultimately as, a, as an artist and designer. And so I started applying a lot of these, what I knew were industry standard practices to how I was collecting my raw material. Um, I even did scientific um, you know, uh, information gathering that didn't exist. I couldn't find anybody in Jordan who had certain scientific information that I needed about our local sheep breeds. For example, you know, what micron measurement is the Jordanian wool? Um, nobody, nobody had that, uh, you know, even people who grow their own sheep um, I tried to reach out to you know, people in uh, teaching institutions and in universities, realized that in Jordan, sheep are studied from a meat production and milk production perspective, but not from a wool perspective. So that's where I found I could really um, contribute by finding out these answers myself. So I started doing things proper according to industry standards. I collected samples uh, of wool to be sent to fiber testing labs to get all of this scientific data that, uh, you know, you would think that as a textile designer, you don't need this kind of scientific data. But I felt like since I was doing all of this, in a way I was doing research that didn't, wasn't available to me, uh, then I had to really do it, um, you know, from A to Z. And I could, and I was interested in doing it. And so uh, that was really the, the essence of how I designed this self, uh, you could say, um, self-motivated and self-designed um, research. And you could see when you actually are there in the environment with the people who are traditionally involved in, in this kind of uh, work or craft, you see that 
everything is interrelated. I mean, when they cut the wool, it's part of their everyday uh, life. They, they line the sheep, they're milking the sheep, they have to milk the sheep twice a day. And so you get to see all of this activity that is part of everyday life that, you know, maybe other people call work. And so we also, in our modern age, tend to, de to divide work from everyday life. And you realize that people have always worked to survive. And so work was very much embedded in everyday activities um, and, and people's survival depended on their work. And so this is a perfect example. I mean, people lived off of these animals from the wool that it produced uh, to create uh, clothing, shelter, also the, the milk, uh, the meat and so on. And so I got to also see firsthand these things and document everything that I was seeing. I was even able to bring my kids with me. It really became this organic uh, you know, type of work for me that it wasn't really separated. I was able to incorporate uh, even my personal life into it, which I was you know, lucky or I'm lucky uh, to be able to do. Uh, here's another example of you know, uh, going all around Jordan from region to region, these practices, I would say the ancient local practices actually differ. Um, here you see people washing the sheep and its wool before the, sh the wool is sheared or cut, as opposed to cutting the wool and then washing it once it's off the animal. And so it was very interesting to see that there is such a thing as, you know, sort of adapting to the environment. You know, it's hot. This was in Wadi Ram. It's hot down there. So they're able to wash the sheep to get a lot of the dirt and dust out then they would shear it the next day. So the wool is actually more clean and manageable once it's off the animal. So that was another practice that I discovered is, is a local, specific local practice. Uh, so while studying the wool itself as a material, you also see its applications historically. Wool has always been integrated into tent making for the Bedouins, uh, rug making, you know, all sorts of things for the household. And you get to document that and really see and people will explain to you, for example, all the different parts of the, the Bedouin tent and all the different animal fibers that go into making the different parts because they all act differently. Goat hair, once it's woven, once it's spun into fiber, uh, into yarns, and then woven into a textile, it behaves differently from a textile made out of 100% sheep's wool. Uh, the goat's hair, which is the black, um, shrinks and tightens up when it gets wet. That's why the tents are mostly black because once it rains, the, the yarns and the weaving lock up, it becomes waterproof actually. Again, this is a perfect example of science, ancient science that's built on um, experience, on trial and error. And so they've developed over time, this system, which is very, very scientific and very innovative of using whatever raw materials they had available, such as animal fibers, for all of these different uses that they needed. And so this was a beautiful also uh, chance to get to document all of this uh, historical craft and um, innovation. Uh, I set off, uh, my next step was to gather a quantity of wool and then process it traditionally, however people used to process it. Again, we at the time did, didn't have, we still don't have an established industry. So the, uh, the sort of obvious thing uh, was to, say, okay, how did we always do this? How did we always traditionally prepare the wool to be able to be used in different uh, crafts or different um, uh, forms? And so I washed a quantity of wool in the hot mineral waters of uh, Ma'in. And um, again, you know, I did that with a group of locals from that area who would share stories with me, you know, saying their grandmother used to do this. Uh, we used to do this a certain way. And you realize that it's, again, it's a perfect example of how these kind of things that they did for survival were interwoven, interwoven into their everyday lives where, you know, it became a family affair. You know, they would bring their kids and the kids would be swimming in the water and having fun while all of this was going on. And so, again, I was always documenting everything that I was seeing and doing. Uh, this is another example of wool washing, but with uh, a gypsy sort of Turkmen uh, family. We washed it in the cold water of this natural spring uh, in uh, the Husban area, Sel Husban in Jordan. 
and uh, even the way they wash the wool was also different. You know, I asked them, how did you traditionally uh, used to wash the wool and prepare it? So I allowed them to show me how they did it. And I documented um, their way of doing it, always while looking for opportunities to, inter to you know, uh, come up with my interventions, you know, based on, I would say, the more proper practices. So this has been the journey. I worked with people who have the traditional uh, knowledge and always try to sort of bring in uh, the more industrialized, more, um, I would say, organized way of practicing these uh, uh, sort of uh, ancient uh, practices. Um, I was always going back and forth between going on the field, doing all of this stuff, producing this raw material that I wanted, and also going back to my studio creating all of these different material samples because you know I had this raw material available to me again it was it was coming to me in so many different forms that I don't always have to turn it into a rug see that's the idea I think most people because when we only see wool in rugs you only think that it's good for rugs but you don't you know you don't get the chance unless you really do the work yourself uh, and discover all of its possibilities you're going to be limited because based on the limited um, you know, applications that you have around you. So I was able to start creating this uh, archive of materials that are, you know, for so many different industries and end uses, but they all come from the same raw material. Uh, I was able to use sometimes hand techniques uh, in making these uh, samples. Sometimes I use machines, whatever I found available to me. Um, I was able to create all of these different samples and really see you know, what could this material be? And even better, I could show it to other people because you could describe something, but it's, it's a different thing when they actually can see it and touch it. Um, so I was always able to also compare the industrially processed wool that I had that I sent to the facility uh, you know, that was produced according to industry standards with the very sort of primitive hand processed wool uh, I could compare it in terms of cleanliness, in terms of texture, uh, look, but really they are the same raw material. Uh, the end result is different because of how you processed it. And so I was able to make these comparisons as well. I started creating yarn. I kept all the different samples, all the different uh, forms of this material throughout the process. So I created this archive of uh, wool, basically. I even uh, looked up different uh, sort of, you know, initiatives, different uh, sources online to see how do they even organize their research material in a way. And I started mimicking that. I would make these sample books, put the, the samples of the hand spun yarn. Each one of these threads was, was hand spun by a different person. Uh, so you make a log of all the people that, uh, you know, you work with. And so I really always, uh, treated this as a very formal project, even though I was uh, in a way designing it myself and funding it mostly myself. Um, it just became this uh, opportunity for me to, you know, apply everything I've learned and say, you know, what if somebody gave me a budget and I were to uh, really do this formally? This is what I would do. And I was always trying to do everything in a very professional way. Um, always keeping samples, always keeping a log uh, of this material. Um, so that was pretty much, you know, my journey into beginning to dive into this, uh, wool, you know, wool uh, world. Uh, I always went back and forth between this material research and going back and uh, applying my sort of more technical design skills um, and going back to this idea that, you know, it all started with weaving, you know, I started weaving and then I started asking questions about the raw material I was using, which in the past I used to buy. And then I got to the point where I was trying to produce it myself. Uh, at the same time, when you're asking questions about the raw material, you're also asking questions about the tools that you're using. So when you practice a craft over time, you realize that there are so many chances uh, for points of intervention that your creative input is not restricted to the final aesthetic of what you're designing and creating. It's not simply about choosing the colors and the patterns of the woven 
textile that I was creating as a textile artist, I realized that I can create from scratch the yarns that I'm using to weave, which will ultimately give me the exact effect that I'm looking for visually and tactily. So uh, I always went back and forth, like I said, you know, between the research and the application. This is a model of this idea that I came up with a while ago where I wanted to push the Bedouin loom as a tool, taking it from just a flat ground loom, uh, turning it into a spatial element that still functioned like a loom. Uh, it still needed to, to weave, um, you know, uh, using the Bedouin techniques, but I also wanted it to become an enclosure. So throughout the process of weaving, I needed it to also sort of mimic this uh, Bedouin home. So a woman would sit there and weave her home while she's, you know, inside of her home as well. So it was this like simultaneous sort of play um, on this uh, craft. So this was the concept model I made. And actually the way I made it, uh, it's a very small scale, but uh, with very fine threads, but it actually functions like a loom. If I were to, if I wanted to, to weave with it, I would actually be able to. So when I made the concept model, for me, it was very important for the threads to be in the right place for me even to test this idea because the concept was to weave uh, and continue to sort of circle around this structure. It, it wasn't going to be a stationary weaving. And I was able to actually achieve that. And this was the concept sort of collage um, that I created as a proposal for uh, my Amman Design Week exhibition piece for 2019. So I developed this idea of taking the Bedouin loom, pushing it as a tool to become this spatial uh, sort of, uh, you know, element, but also that functioned as a loom. It still functioned and I was able to weave with it. Um, for this, uh, for the second edition of my installation, uh, I wanted it to be a truly 100% Jordanian product because for the first edition, which I will show pictures of uh, later on, I didn't have enough time to produce all of my wool that's locally grown, Jordanian wool, locally processed. I didn't have enough time to produce the required amount of wool. I ended up having to buy imported wool. Um, for the second sort of edition of it, which was supposed to be exhibited in the Tokyo Art Fair in March of 2020, so last year, uh, I wanted to continue with this idea of producing Jordanian wool from A to Z and using it in such an installation. And I just continued with this wool research. I produced the yarn. Uh, that's when I also decided to collaborate with other uh, craftspeople that I found discovered uh, locally in Jordan, one of them being Tan Crafts. Uh, they are occupied with natural dyeing. Uh, they were very excited when I approached them and asked them if they would dye some wool for me. They had always dyed uh, cotton uh, and some other cellulose-based uh, fibers. And for them, it was the first time they were gonna experiment with dyeing wool. And they uh, totally embraced this new experiment and they did it in, a, in such a sort of scientific way, which I really enjoyed because they were people who prepared their dye material um, in, in, and kept you know, recipes and exact amounts of everything so that they can actually go back and reference and know how did we achieve this uh, color versus that. And so I really enjoyed their process and I found it to be a, a nice sort of step forward from this traditional uh, way of just eyeballing everything because this is how we've always kind of uh, done things in a sort of just like trial and error way. So they were able to produce some really nice, very detailed, uh, samples for me and and saved you know all the information you know we got this shade from this uh, percentage of dye um, you know uh, for you know the weight of the yarn and so on and and so we produced some really beautiful samples and again we always try to keep everything uh, organized and archived to refer back to in a way that allows us to really sort of like um, work in a scientific way. Uh, the, second the second sort of uh, group I worked with in the dyeing process was the Rhodes Safi crafts who grow and make dye out of indigo. So uh, I went down there also with tan crafts and uh, we dyed a sample of wool, you know, tested the different intensities of the dye and pretty much, you know, uh, again, 
the ladies of Ghoris Safi had never really worked with wool before. And so, you know, it was a nice sort of also experiment for them. And we worked together like that. You know, we created samples in the beginning. And then when it was time to produce the final quantity, uh, we were able to do that. And so this is pretty much the, uh, almost the final outcome of this process. I chose three colors uh, for my final installation for Tokyo the white natural color, the red madder, which comes from madder root, and then the blue indigo, based on um, textiles, dyed textiles that I found at Tiraz uh, Museum in Amman. So I discovered that traditionally, you know, ages ago, we did grow dyes in this uh, region and madder and indigo were very common uh, dyes used on textiles. And uh, this is the sort of, the first edition of this uh, weaving installation, which was exhibited at Amman Design Week 2019, using the imported wool. So uh, the concept of the loom being transformed into the spatial element and it functioning as a loom uh, worked very well. Uh, so that was the, the installation. And as you can see, you know, when I was preparing for the second edition of this installation, which is the Tokyo edition, my, my studio pretty much looked like this all the time. I was constantly working towards producing this raw material, all while discovering all of these other, uh, you know, uh, beautiful things uh, and, and built this uh, quite an archive of um, everything, materials you, uh, that come from Jordanian wool, basically. Um, so in a way, I was practicing something that um, had sort of pushed me to expand my skill set laterally. Uh, I went from somebody with creative ideas and some craft knowledge to practicing this craft enough to be able to consider myself a craftsperson. I could look at a woven Bedouin rug and say, if I see a detail, I can say, oh, they did this here because maybe one of the threads uh, broke during the weaving and they had to somehow uh, resolve this problem. So they ended up doing this. You know, I, I really uh, felt like I got to the point where I could, uh, you know, I could uh, understand the ins and outs of, uh, of this craft because I put myself in that position. I was the one to do something from A to Z. I did not only rely on the craftspeople. And that's something that I think it's very important, this idea to really stop looking at ourselves as strictly this or that, especially when you talk about design and the arts, we've traditionally uh, for so long have seen artists and creatives coming up with the ideas and having other people who are the craftspeople uh, realize and implement these to uh, come up with a product. That works very well and has worked so far, but I really think it has limited us, especially in our region where you don't have a lot of advanced industries, you know, that are supporting a lot of these design industries, you know, in terms of uh, manufacturing, in terms of raw material production. And so it's very important for artists and creatives to really sort of push themselves to become at the level of craftspeople, especially if, if you're working with any material, whether it's wood or metal or uh, fibers, uh, even uh, you know uh, pigments and dyes and paints, you do once in a while run into people who are following this sort of organic path. When you don't have an easy alternative, you end up at yourself. And in that process, you run into so many beautiful surprises. And actually, in a way, I think, some people might look at it as reinventing the wheel. You know, maybe we're doing something in a very primitive way instead of just going to a source that can give us this uh, already sort of uh, prepared and why don't we just import the kind of wool that we want, you know, something as close as possible to what we wanna do or use. But actually there's nothing wrong with reinventing the wheel. And I knew I was doing that because uh, there's always an easier way you know, always an easier step to rely on someone else to do something for you. But it's really nice to just say, you know what? I know other people have done this many, many times. So many people have hand spun yarn. I can go to somebody who can hand spin for me, but it's really good for me to actually do it myself. And by, you know, learning this new uh, skill, which to me 
it wasn't something I ever did, which is spinning, spinning yarn into, uh, sorry, spinning fibers into yarns or threads. I discovered all these tools that you need for spinning. And I moved, you know, from the traditional drop spindle, which is this universal tool. Every civilization has pretty much invented the same exact tool without seeing what others have done. It's because it's so logical. It's the same basic concept. And you get to see how when people think and when, when there's a function uh, you know, uh, required of this tool, you can actually arrive to the same design because you know, sometimes it's, it's very logical the way something, you know, basically logic is universal. And so people, human beings over time and across the world, and, and across history have really come to the same conclusions over and over. It doesn't mean that, uh, you know, oh, they didn't add something or that what's the point somebody else has done this. It's really not about who did it first. It's about who, did, who does it better. And that's really how I started to look at my design practice is I'm not the first to do this, but I should discover my particular mode of applying this basic knowledge that's pretty universal. And those small surprises in between when you're actually holding, like if I were to just look up in the internet that, oh, okay, you know, wool can come in this form. I can look at a million pictures of this and visualize in my head, okay, if I were to order this and have it shipped to me, what would I do with it? You know, it's very different when you have it in your hands and you're actually producing it yourself and you see how it, it went from this this like really dusty, dirty fiber to, to this, to this, you know, to this or this. And so by being present for all the steps, you realize that you're actually acquiring uh, more skills, but also more job titles in a way. Um, and that for me really just became a very, very uh, fulfilling way of design. I knew I needed a certain product as a finished product, but I can also start from the very beginning in planning how I was to produce my raw material exactly the way I want it to look and feel ultimately in my final product. So um, this was really sort of the example of my journey in particular. And by actually not shying from aspiring to be a, an expert, you know, when I, when I did the training with the American sheep industry and I saw who were the people that were signing up for this kind of program, pretty much most of them, if not all, most of them were people who owned their own sheep and just wanted to deepen their knowledge, you know, and understand the industry because it's something they live off of, they sell that wool, they need to understand how it needs to be prepared. Um, but there were just a few, uh, you could say like scholars, uh, university people who were doing research on fibers. And I was the only person who comes from a design background, you could say who's an artist, who was in this uh, training program. And I found myself uh, really mixing with people who come from such different industries, you know, agriculture. And yet I was able to really learn so much from them and they were also in a way they were fascinated to see that somebody as an end user of this raw material you know somebody instead of going and buying this you know was somebody who's looking at how it's even produced and uh, for me that was instrumental i treated myself like a professional i said you know what it's not enough to just read about it i need to commit to this you know i need to do this training uh, consider myself somebody who really wants to uh, div, uh, dive, dive deeply into this um, uh, realm. And it didn't limit me as an artist. It's not like I abandoned my job description as a designer or a creative to be able to acquire this knowledge. And for me, really, that was the first major proof that you can be so many different things. All you need is just the time to dedicate to acquiring knowledge, trying things out, um, really look at other disciplines and try to uh, approach any information you get as if you're smart. You can understand that. Why not? You know, we were all very smart. Everybody's very, very intelligent. Um, and if you really put your mind to it, you can become so knowledgeable in so many different things. Uh, I was very pleasantly surprised to see examples of people applying this sort of 
uh, way of thinking. Uh, locally in Jordan, I discovered, uh, for example, uh, somebody called Rabia Azreat. He makes knives. Um, locally, all the materials, uh, you know, are grown in Jordan. Uh, and then he he uh, he wanted one day to to create a a bag to carry the nai as an instrument. He had certain requirements for this bag. He wanted the raw material of the bag to be, you could say, a cousin of the nai. The nai is made, you know, um, out of the um, the cane that's grown in the Jordan Valley. Around it, there are a lot of other uh, plants grown in the same climate, the same temperature. And uh, he wanted it to not be something to house this nigh, but be something so foreign. So he went almost to the same area, the same source, <laughs> to look for uh, fibers that can help him, you know, uh, create this, this uh, house or bag for the nigh. Another requirement was that when you use the nai and you play it, it becomes uh, um, saturated. And uh, he needed it to be breathable. So that was another requirement. And so he went out, started researching, found people who use certain plants uh, to weave with. It's a technique he never did himself. And so he worked with these craftspeople, told them what he needs. They, there was this back and forth uh, exchange of, this is what I need. Can it look like this? And then the weaver or the person who knows the material would uh, give him feedback saying, no, if you were to use this uh, you know, plant fiber, it will not allow you to do these tight uh, circles, better use this. And so together they were able to create uh, this uh, bag for his nai made out of a saf, uh, basically, a locally grown uh, uh, plant fiber. And so you could see this is a beautiful example of somebody being completely self-sufficient in a way, going locally and going through this uh, research pr uh, process, you know, asking questions, reflecting, researching the material and trial and error. Um, and so, you know, it, I'm always very, very happy to see examples of this. Another example of... Uh, a, a process, a way of thinking, which is let's let's be the people to do something. Um, a lot of people might not think that, for example, agriculture is very much related to design or textiles. But for me, I find um, the the initiative, something called uh, Zikra Initiative from Jordan, uh, very similar to what my journey with wool has been. You know, they they looked into this idea of well, we used to plant wheat to make our bread locally? Why are we importing wheat, flour, and different kinds of flours to make bread when we used to be self-sufficient in that way? And they went back and started, you know, coming together and planting wheat in open uh, plots of land around the city of Amman. So you don't even have to go out into the country into what, what would be considered traditional uh, agriculture uh, land and planting wheat, and then from year to year, the people of the neighborhood who got together and planted this wheat were able to actually harvest the wheat. And then their next step was to say, okay, let's look at all the different indigenous wheat uh, types that we have that we can grow. And then what kind of different breads and how do you ferment it uh, and use it uh, basically. And so you see, them going through this organic process, you know, and it, it really is a research. And ultimately they are in a way organically reviving old practices that we've lost a long time ago. Um, this is what I felt like I was doing with the wool. You know, I went from being curious about this raw material, wanting to produce it myself, uh, being very, very serious about my approach, be, taking, uh, you know, sort of a, a formal approach to things. And then to the point where, you know, as of last year, I was talking to the Ministry of Environment of Jordan on different uh, programs I could design for them to launch uh, a wool industry in Jordan. Everything from, uh, you know, the way you produce it, you know, the shearing program, you know, how you collect the wool, how you prepare it to be processed, all the way to even, uh, you know, establishing a mini processing industry. And that's where I think for me, one of the best things that came out of actually doing everything myself is discovering the potential 
of creating a mini industry. Mini industry is possible in pretty much every discipline. I really believe you don't have to have advanced machinery. You know, you don't have to have like millions of uh, dollars of budgets to compete with the already established countries that produce certain things. That's not the idea. You know, just because we don't have an established wool industry that processes and exports wool to the world, like Australia, New Zealand, you know, does not mean we cannot have our own scale of such an industry. And by me, actually, I'm going to go back to my picture of my studio. By working with all of these literally small scale machines, I discovered that a lot of advanced machinery is based on these simple and often actually prehistoric tools. You know, again, the spindle that is, has been used for spinning is a universal model that every culture has designed and then developed into what you see now if you walk into a, uh, you know, an advanced industrial uh, spinning mill, you see all of these computerized uh, machines that are just so complicated looking, but actually when you understand the basic concept of what spinning fiber is, and you've done it on a primitive tool, and slowly move from a primitive tool to maybe a little mechanized machine, such as the one I have in the sort of in the center uh, top of my table, this thing that has a sort of a round little wheel, white wheel. This is a very mini version of an electri uh, electric spinner that goes from your hand operated uh, manual spinner to a version of a small electric spinner. This spinner is the basic model for the more advanced and more, uh, you know, actually advanced and, and much bigger machines that can spin a million threads instead of one, basically. So you, you do see the progression of how humans have gone from primitive tools, constantly built on them, and ultimately basically innovated them into this really high-tech machinery that you see in most industries. So I was able to see that if we lack those really, really advanced and very expensive machinery, we can start with something more basic and we can actually produce those tools ourselves to a large extent. Um, so going back to these kind of examples, um, again, one might think, what, what does agriculture have to do with you know, the textile or design industry? You really have to believe that everything's interrelated and everything um, really feeds uh, other, other areas of life. And, Ultimately, what you're developing is a thought process. How do you come up with an idea and how do you design your action plan to arrive to where you want to go, whether you're dealing with wheat or whether you're dealing with wool or whether you're dealing with metal, you know, or even electronics, I think. Uh, this is another initiative in Jordan, which I really, really uh, am enjoying what they're doing. They're called Tayun and they deal a lot with um, native plants. Uh, understanding native plants, you know, foraging, uh, you know, discovering that there are so many native plants that we can actually consume and eat, um, you know, this kind of knowledge that is pretty much lost. And again, feeds to this idea that Zikra initiative is also focusing on is this idea of why are we so dependent on everything being imported when we have resources within. And so, and that's what's beautiful. They recently did uh, a native plants workshop and the way they gathered the information is just so beautiful. You know, when you really get a bunch of people together and, uh, you know, if the goal is to share this knowledge with people and put it together in a very sort of concise, clear way, it really becomes a very valuable resource for everyone else. But until somebody actually does this, we continue to believe that we do not have these kind of resources, unfortunately. Um, I'd like to share a couple of examples of designers who are, again, going back to tradition, to history and craft to produce things that are super uh, innovative uh, for the future. One such person is Abir Seqali, a Jordanian architect and uh, designer and curator. Um, she is developing you know, a model for a tent based on uh, you know, the Bedouin tent, uh, the weaving craft and the local materials. And uh, again, you know, by exploring this sort of like, um, 
you know, by actually going through this uh, journey that she's been on and exploring the different materials and making all these samples, um, she's developed also a design language that she's applying not only to this tent necessarily, but to other things, such as um, the piece that she exhibited at Amman Design Week in 2019 uh, called uh, uh, Meeting Points. And it was this sort of um, uh, structural partition that was made out of animal and plant fibers. And it was just, for me, such a perfect example of a designer going out and you know, looking for her own raw materials based on what's available, working hand in hand between sourcing the raw material, then creating it to um, serve a certain function in terms of the craft and how you actually use this um, raw material with the technique that you choose, you know, and, uh, and so, I think it's 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 great to see more and more designers emerging working in this way. In a way, it's out of limitation. You know, when you don't have everything readily available to you, you are gonna naturally, if you're really persistent and you really wanna get to where you're going, you will go through this natural, organic uh, process of discovering your very personal design language. Another designer I really, really enjoy is uh, Hala Kaikso, uh, who's Bahraini. And she's a designer who uh, you know, learned weaving and uh, started designing garments out of uh, you know, sort of organically uh, produced um, fabrics. Uh, and then she discovered that uh, you know, ages ago, cotton used to be planted in Bahrain. And so she started actually experimenting and planting cotton in her backyard. Because you know our climate or their climate, I mean, uh, uh, allow for cotton planting, and so you see that there are designers who you know are sort of acquiring different job titles. You know, she's a designer and artist, but she's also become in a way a farmer. You know, creating her own cotton, discovering that uh, there are cottons that uh, exist naturally with uh, with a pigment with color. So you can have brown co uh, cotton, you can have green cotton, and so on. And so when you uh, dive into producing your own raw material, your end product will definitely be different and will be more unique. You're not just buying your raw material from the same place that everybody else is buying their raw material and then producing your product. And that's, uh, you know, that's for me sharing these uh, few examples is proof that any creative working with any craft, whether you're uh, a fashion designer working in knitting, for example, or you're a furniture designer working with wood and, and metal, if you actually start to uh, investigate where your materials come from and going back, instead of being, you could say, you know, in, in the timeline of production, you have the people who grow the raw material and then the people who prepare it to be uh, sent off to the industry and then the people who uh, buy it and distribute it. And then you are the end user as a designer you manipulate this material, uh, you know, you use whatever technique and craft that you choose to make the end uh, product. But actually, you as the designer don't have to be at the end of this timeline, you can actually be way at the beginning. And if you're not doing it yourself, you know, I, I understand sometimes not everybody can literally have a, a farm as a designer or artist and a farm and start farming while they're doing their other practices, but at least when you join forces with other people, when you connect with others who, if you don't have this mechanism or the knowledge, at least you can be there and inform the other person. Um, there's always somebody doing uh, something, you know, uh, pursuing something that you could learn from, that you could use in your design practice. Uh, and the more you really be involved in every step of the creation, uh, the more you feel your product is authentic and unique, you will definitely not produce something that everybody else is producing. And so that's really the, the essence of this uh, uh, presentation is to not shy away from uh, expanding yourself laterally, go into other disciplines, um, more importantly, actually look at your own past from a production perspective, whichever country you're in, you know, every country in our region has had a really rich and innovative productive past. Um, there's something I think that has to do with colonialism, unfortunately, that makes us believe, we've been educated to believe that, uh, you know, 
maybe our history in terms of innovation only started after you know we've been colonized and we've been introduced to these western ways of life and western advances when that's not true at all you know every civilization every people around the globe for them to have survived this long have had to be innovative and you when you look deeper into uh, our history you realize we we don't really have a history not because it didn't exist it's because we did not early on recognize the importance of documentation the west early on in a smart way realized that it's very important to document because when you document something that's it everybody uh, you know around the world will see that you've done this and so the people in the west i believe in general the, the western civilization uh, it was was smart in that way. They uh, began to document their history extensively to the point where it's also sold to the rest of the world. So when you talk or when you're trying to look at industrial paths, uh, pasts or um, you know traditions, you, you find tons of information about Western uh, you know uh, industries and Western crafts. But what about the other parts of the world? It doesn't mean we didn't have craft cultures and craft uh, innovative uh, pasts. It's just that we never uh, documented that. And also on top of that, we haven't been packaging it and marketing it to our young and youth, you know, uh, throughout our education systems. We just haven't been sold, you know, uh, uh, this, this idea that we do have a, a productive past. And so I think luckily we do have, you know, now a, a generation of creatives and artists who really are looking inwards and are really uh, invested in documenting a lot of aspects of our cultures and history. But this is a very recent thing for us. Um, and, and I really believe that when something is not readily available to you in terms of research or information, go out there, look for it yourself, meet people that might have some remnants of this old knowledge but most importantly look for look look for signs all around you wherever you are you know whether you're sitting in uh you know a restaurant in the middle of uh you know the desert or uh you know in somebody's house or wherever you are look at everything like a child would with amazement with wonder and keep asking you know yourself like oh that, that table you know, the leg meets the top of the table. I wonder like, uh, you know, why that particular joint was designed or why the, the person who ever made that table, um, you know, chose to make the connection this way. Even if you think the answer is obvious, really think like a child, look all around you and you will see signs of this innovation, especially in, in old historic, uh, you know, um, artifacts and remnants, you know, whether it's our architecture, whether it's our textiles and clothing, uh, tools that we've used, you know, furniture and so on, you know, our history is evident and all around us. It's just not something that we were taught to look for, for an, uh, as an education. Um, and, and for me, that's, that's really what I come out with basically out of this journey is that we did have a very productive, very innovative past uh, a lot of traditional and old crafts were developed uh, given certain circumstances and limitations at times. When you actually really analyze them, uh, you realize that there was a lot of inventiveness and a lot of um, innovation that goes into it. And, and by understanding that, we could really take that to the next step. We just have to really look inwards. Uh, for us to be able to imagine a future that is truly ours in terms of identity. Um, and the only other thing I think that's very important, uh, you know, in the education of designers in general, there's a lot of emphasis on aesthetics and style, which I understand, you know, it's very important, but it's equally important to always keep in mind function, and especially uh, in a context, you know, cultural, geographic, historical context. We get some, well, it depends on which school you go to and what kind of philosophy, you know, uh, you know, your professors have or your particular school has, but every culture, again, every, every country, every culture has had its way of arriving to an aesthetic, but through function. 
because ultimately, historically, I think people always created and designed things to perform a certain function. And, and with that, I believe that, you know, in always wanting things to look attractive, you know, you do get like that uh, sort of the development of an aesthetic or style. Human beings always pursued beauty, I believe. Uh, but you can find a lot of information when you actually focus not on the aesthetics, but on the function and, and, and the way people have sort of created things, the way materials come together, uh, you begin to develop a better understanding of um, manufacturing and industry, which I believe art and design have to go hand in hand with production and industry. Um, and, and I think that can only be done if designers uh, get out of their box as only artists or designers and become knowledgeable craftspeople and really dive deep into material uh, science and research. Great, Shraf, thank you so much for what an inspiring talk, actually, um, and a really nice um, note to wrap up uh, this beautiful presentation. I would like actually to hear from, uh, from our attendees and our students if you have any question or any kind of uh, comment to say, you can um, uh, open your mic yourself and ask it, or you can put it in the chat and I can read it to Ishraf. Ashraf, um, uh, yeah, maybe I can start with uh, something actually to, to connect with your last point. Um, you, you believe in education, and this is also what you uh, recently also been doing in, uh, in Jordan, right? You are uh, organizing uh, a few uh, workshops uh, for uh, young people to, uh, and also like uh, they could be creative, but they could also be anyone who's interested in the craft. Can you tell us something about that, about uh, this experience and... Yes, absolutely. Um, luckily, I, uh, you know, I, I had this uh, idea of uh, offering uh, these sort of techniques and skills for anybody who would be interested um, to explore, you know, techniques in textile construction, starting with weaving, uh, felting is another technique, you know, the world of textiles and uh, textile production is so uh, large. And just by starting with one technique, which is weaving, you realize that actually it opens doors into so many, uh, you could say sub worlds. And I really believe that it's something as a skill, even motor and mental skill, anybody can benefit from it and uh, really build on it, think very unique to themselves. I, again, I keep stressing the idea that you can be a doctor or a vet or a mechanic uh, you know, or a lawyer and learn a craft and really actually get to a point where you can innovate it as well. Uh, we should really blur the lines between all of these titles that we've been taught to take on and, and really stick to. Uh, you can have so many different titles. And the idea was actually to start by introducing these different techniques open to anybody who's interested. And luckily I found um, Platform 27 was very excited about uh, helping me do that. And together we designed this program where we were gonna start with one technique such as weaving, uh, teach the fundamentals of it and uh, start sort of moving forward and offering more advanced, even more uh, innovative ways of uh, weaving, uh, but always building on the most basic um, you know, craft and skill. And uh, we did have a few workshops which were very successful. The participants you know, gave us some uh, great feedback because I really believe uh, that you know, understanding weaving and practicing it, for example, could be very beneficial for even you know, a, a dancer, a fine artist, a sculptor, uh, even actually you know, a, a vet, for example. You know, uh, if, if you look uh, more deeply into textiles as an introduction to this weaving uh, workshop, I gave examples of uh, the uses of textiles because when you say textiles and weaving, immediately most people think fashion, fabrics, you know, decor, home decor, things like that. But you don't realize that the, the technology of weaving as a structure of creating this film or surface 
is used in medicine. You know, it's used to make grafts, you know, that go into body parts and the fibers have to be from a certain uh, material to be able to be inside the human body without creating a reaction. And you realize that um, by understanding these and actually acquiring these skills, there's so much further innovation that comes out. And so it was very important for us to offer these kind of workshops to pretty much anybody. And, you know, the first couple of workshops we did, we had a nice mix of, uh, of people. So it wasn't just the artists and designers who showed up. So yeah, I absolutely think it's very, very important because I actually looked into a lot of the design programs in the region that teach fashion design, uh, interior design, and almost none of them really go into detail in terms of material production related to textiles and using textile, um, you know, uh, technology. So, Great. yeah. Um, I would take another question from the student. Um, uh, what initially interested you to take your master in textile? Like why, why, where this, is, where this spark begins? Sure. Um, uh, I studied architecture. I wanted, always wanted to be a designer. And uh, meanwhile, I always uh, sewed and played around with fashion design. I learned sewing from my mother. Uh, I don't know if anybody's that age. Do you remember the Borda magazine? We grew up with it 80s and 90s. You could trace patterns and make clothes for yourself. My mom taught me how to do that. I used to make clothes for myself. And it stayed with me throughout my education in architecture. I always took the architectural concepts, you know, the, the art history, uh, the theory, and always imagined clothing. Because ultimately, after working in architecture for a few years, I realized that I want to make with my hands, but at a much smaller scale also, not just think about buildings. You know, it was such a large scale for me. Uh, and the materials in architecture were so foreign in the sense they were not, they did not feel natural to me. I wasn't able to touch things with my hands that I was designing. And so I left architecture and pursued fashion design. I left uh, Amman, went to New York City where I interned in the industry, uh, building on my pre-acquired skills. You know, I had enough skill actually to work in the industry without a degree in fashion, because again, I'm self-taught. Uh, I continued to practice, you know, sewing, pattern making. I would take my free electives in, in college uh, you know, in architecture, but I would have free electives in the fashion design department, like a few classes that I felt were skills I needed. So I, early on, I really branched out of this sort of box. Uh, and I never only looked at myself as an architect. And after a few years of being in fashion, um, I discovered something called textile innovation. I started going to fashion, uh, sorry, uh, textile fairs that happened in New York City uh, several times a year. That's when I realized, you know, I used to be the kind of, I would say, aspiring fashion designer who would go and buy my fabric. So I would have an idea in mind and I'll go to find that specific fabric. I didn't know that a designer themselves can actually create their own fabric based on what they want. So you're not limited by what the market is giving you. And in fact, actually all the biggest brands, I mean, the biggest, biggest labels, Chanel, uh, Giorgio Armani, all these, you know, really established fashion houses, only make textiles for themselves. They don't go out and buy textiles from China. You know, they don't go to a fabric fair and buy the same fabric that everybody else is doing, uh, buying. They actually create their fabric from scratch, beginning from the aesthetic and the concept to the execution. They have a person who's a textile designer or specialist within the fashion house, who is the co connection between the creative director or the fashion designer and the factories that make the textiles for this particular label. And then you have somebody at that fab, uh, factory who becomes sort of the knowledgeable person in, uh, you know, like you'll have in the factory, one person who handles always Armani's orders or uh, always works with the uh, Galliano or Chanel. And so you have this very intimate relationship between the fashion industry and the fabric production industry um, and for me, that's when I started to become actually more interested in creating the, the textiles as opposed to making clothes with them. Um, and I saw them basically as the building blocks of everything, not only fashion, but everything, literally. And so um, for me, that was the introduction is from fashion 
I discovered you can create your own textiles. And then I ended up uh, doing my master's degree in textile design. And I really discovered that it was the perfect medium and the perfect place for me because I can really use all of my architectural knowledge, my past experience in fashion. And actually I had a, a, a three period stint as a fashion uh, journalist because I was always just uh, you know, interested in being in the industry in one way or another. So I was you know, training to, in, in fashion, I was an intern uh, learning fashion design, but at the same time, I ended up getting a job as a fashion journalist. It, it enabled me to stay in the industry. And I started to actually uh, look at the industry from a journalistic perspective. I started going to the fashion uh, shows and I was always a documentarian naturally. And so that role for me to become a journalist just came on very naturally. Um, so that's when I decided, you know what, my perfect place is to be somebody who made and designed the raw materials. And it just really just all happened very organically for me. And I have to say, I never felt, not for a moment that I was ever leaving something and starting something else. Like when I left architecture, started designing clothes, I did not feel like, okay, I'm abandoning my architecture past. Now I'm a whole new other person again, you know, learning this. It was simply, I had the same thought process. I was just applying it to a different scale and different set of materials. Uh, the same thing with when I, when I learned, uh, dove deeper into material creation, I'm still the same person. Now I'm just more focused on actual, uh, you know, um, you could say that on the micro level of design instead of the macro level. So Great. for me, it was just an organic uh, journey. Yeah. So uh, how long did it take you to step out of your comfort zone and start exploring the raw material? So if you, if you, if you like, uh, uh, can give us like, um, how long? I, I know it's years, but, but like uh, students are really curious to know like how to start, how, uh, if you can give them also a tip, encourage them where to start. Uh, this is also, uh, could you address this in this question? Sure. I really, there wasn't a moment, I think, when it started. I think it was simply a combination of being limited, not having access to uh, something I needed to pursue and push my project forward. At the same time, being curious and asking questions and not being satisfied with maybe even somebody else's answers. I felt like I needed to find the answers for myself. And um, I always think back, I had a very, very amazing architecture professor, uh, Italian uh, architect, uh, his name, he's a late, uh, you know, passed away, the late uh, Marco Frescari. He's very well known. He's, he's uh, written a lot about architecture and a really amazing person. He always said, you know, wonder. He used this word a lot. You have to wonder. You have to ask questions. So by wondering, you're actually being fascinated and curious about everything, just like a child. And I remember always uh, trying to push myself to be like that. You know, even if somebody else has done something, I have to imagine like nobody else has done it and I wanna do it myself. And really it comes from, the drive comes from this need to uh, make with my hands. I always had to be making something with my hands. Um, and you really discover that Again, if somebody else has done it or can do it even better than you, it doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, you know? It doesn't mean that if you're a certain age and you haven't learned a certain skill or mastered a certain skill, that it's too late to start. We, we, we are so unlimited as, as human beings that I cannot stress that enough. You know, you could spend your whole life expanding on your knowledge and not be, it, not be done. You know, yes, we, we have to specialize in what we do. You have to kind of deepen your knowledge vertically and keep going deeper and deeper. And that's what you, you know, then you're called an expert. But even an expert in one thing can also, I would say simultaneously, uh, you know, go laterally and really cross into other disciplines. And I really think the, the key is uh, time management. You have to manage your time in a way that makes it so that you can put the time into doing things yourself. You can uh, have the time to um, create your own design process, uh, take the steps, design your steps yourself. And even if you're, again, doing something that somebody else has done, the fact that you're doing it yourself 
is gonna really, um, I think, build you as a creative and a designer very differently than when you're just looking at what other people are doing and thinking, oh, okay, now I know it's possible. Somebody else did it. Maybe I need to do something different. Again, it's not about who does it first. It's about who does it better. You know, reinvent things. Really look, look at things as if you're seeing them for the first time. And um, go into your kitchen. Look at the things that you look at every day. You know, even food items, things we throw in the garbage. You know, um, kind of allow yourself to really be naive in a sense. Imagine you're isolated and you don't have actually at the you know, press of, you know, whatever, tap of a finger, go on the internet and see all of this amazing design stuff. I mean, when I was aspiring to be a designer, uh, growing up as a teenager, I was uh, used to create scrapbooks for myself. I literally didn't even know there was such a thing as scrapbooking. I would uh, wait till my mom finished reading uh, her magazines. When I knew she wasn't like looking at them anymore, I would steal them. <laughs> I would cut pictures out of them create all these scrapbooks of anything and everything that I found fascinating, whether I understood what it was about or whether I didn't understand. Sometimes just seeing an image, you know, I'm like, wow, there's something about this, you know, very fascinating. And I, that's when I dis discovered I'm drawn to design in general, you know, just seeing the way a designer created the color of a shirt for the first time that was different from all the colors I've ever seen. I remember being like, this is something I need to save. And I would cut all of these images and it crossed not only in fashion, but it crossed into furniture design, architecture. And we're talking like, this is before I decided to study architecture. And so you're talking in a time when there wasn't the internet, the, the, the visual inspiration wasn't so readily available. You know, it took so much time for you to actually see what's going on in the design world. So you find yourself actually brewing in your own ideas much longer. Now everything is so fast that actually I, I recognize as a, as a person who's lived in both times, it's much harder to be truly creative right now. You really have to kind of untrain yourself to depend on this uh, sort of availability of, of all of this inspiration and imagery and really go back to imagining that you're isolated. Imagine that you don't have access to see what other designers are doing. And you're just following this very naive and very almost like natural way of doing things. You know, I always use kids as an example because you know, I became a mom, I raised kids, I'm raising my kids still. And um, I see when they come up sometimes to me and they say, oh, look, I made a chair. And you look at it and you're like, wow, you know, they made a chair out of the strangest things. In their mind, this is a chair. And you really have to try to teach yourself to be like that because trust me, the journey, uh, you know, in, in self-discovery that way is so um, rewarding. You know, when you feel like you don't know anything and you're really looking uh, to find something out or, you know, you don't know how something works and you, especially when you're using your hands and you go through the steps to get to the point where you can actually do it yourself. My goodness, the satisfaction is so amazing. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I hope that answered the question. Yes, great, Ishraq. I think we can go on on forever. It's such uh, uh, an inspiration, everything you showed us, and also like this uh, passion. Also, it's very clearly to see your passion uh, through the whole uh, process, but also like your, uh, I think, uh, uh, I just want to like close with a comment, like you said that you're inventing the wheel. I don't think you're doing that because like the, all your documentation and the research you did uh, could be really useful for uh, other designers who actually can um, um, go back to it and use it also as inspiration for their own work. So I hope one day you can make it available or if uh, anyone uh, would like to contact you that if it's, it's possible and you can uh, make this available uh, for them and uh, share it with uh, many people as possible. Um, thank you so much again. And um, uh, I hope we can host you again with another story and another uh, project. And good luck with your future projects. I know you have a lot of uh, uh, commission and a lot of uh, um, artworks to display uh, around the world. And also good luck with your projects with the government in Jordan. I know you're doing like uh, great uh, work there. So good luck.
it will be amazing if it's go through. Hopefully thank after you. the pandemic. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, the last thing I want to say is for my installation that didn't uh, get exhibited in Japan, uh, I brought all the material, the wool and everything I need to uh, New York with me. Uh, I'm here sort of um, unsure of how long I will be. Um, I still don't have a return date uh, to go back to Jordan. But in the meantime, I thought, you know, the idea was to take this project and really share it with a more global audience. Uh, since I shared it the first uh, edition with my Jordanian and you could say Middle Eastern regional audience. And so this is hopefully uh, my next step is to uh, somehow showcase the installation somewhere here, maybe in New York City. I'm working on it. And um, I even brought pieces of, you know, trees, uh, you know, that were cut in my neighborhood in Amman, which I know I can use uh, to create my loom, my Bedouin loom. And so everything from the wood uh, of the loom to the wool, uh, to me as a you know weaver is all 100% Jordanian. So we will see. You know, hopefully uh, I'll find the right place and time for um, this installation so that the, the project can uh, you know continue. Great, Ishra. Uh, thank you again, and hopefully we we'll see you soon. I think everybody, you can see in the chat that they loved it. They were inspired. So thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Good night, everyone. Yeah. Good night. Bye. Bye.